Section 2.6, Molecules and Molecular Compounds. A molecule consists of two or more atoms that are bound tightly together. And they're many times either sharing electrons or they have stolen electrons in such a way that they are bound like, like static electricity. But normally when you call, say something is a molecule, it's sharing electrons, and they're almost always nonmetals that do this, nonmetals with nonmetals. Remember that they're in the upper right corner of the periodic table. The subscript to the right of the symbol, so like if you have something like H2, the symbol is hydrogen, and the 2 is telling you that there are two hydrogen bound together and that this is a molecule. So this is a molecule of hydrogen, H2. This is a molecule of water. So you've got H2 and O. So the subscript to the right underneath the, the element is telling you how many of those elements there are. So it's almost like a little recipe or a formula. So this is two H's in water, one oxygen. So the red here is, is depiction of oxygen. The water is white, so there's two hydrogens to each oxygen, and they're bound together. So it's not just that they're sitting together, they're actually connected together and they're, they're one thing. Hydrogen peroxide would be two oxygens, oxygens bound together and hydrogens attached to it. Carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. This is methane, uh, methane is natural gas, and then ethylene. Uh, ethylene glycol is uh, like antifreeze. There are seven molecules, um, all nonmetals, that are called diatomic. And di means two, and atomic, at atoms, two atoms. So what's happened is that these guys are so reactive that they even react with themselves. So hydrogen will always be H2 in the free state. If you ever would have hydrogen in the air um, or a, in a tank, a tank of hydrogen, um, it's always H2. Nitrogen is the same, N2, oxygen is O2, and then the first four in the column of group seven in the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. All of these are always a I2, Br2, Cl2. They're always diatomic. There's several different types of formulas. Let's look at molecular first. A molecular formula gives the exact number of atoms of each element in a compound. So if you were to have uh, sugar, okay, so sugar here is C6H12O6. This is only one form of sugar, it's sucrose. Um, this is telling you that in one molecule of sugar, there are six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. The empirical formula is the lowest ratio, whole number ratio, of the atoms in an element uh, or in a compound. So if you were to take sugar, which always is C6H12O6, and be asked for the empirical formula, the empirical formula is just the lowest ratio. So... I can, I can take 6 and divide it equally into all three of these elements. So 6 will go into carbon one time, 6 will go into hydrogen twice, and 6 will go into oxygen once. And so its empirical formula would be CH2O. That's the empirical formula. The molecular is what you actually see, the molecule actually is. Often... Before you can find out the molecular formula, you're going to have to figure out the, the empirical formula and then from um, gain more information in order to figure out what exactly it looks like or what's bound to what. A structural formula shows the order. It's not just that there's H2O, but you're, uh, which would be water, but it's showing you how they're attached to each other. So in the case of the one given here, um, a molecular formula would be CH4. Okay, that's methane. The structural formula is showing you that carbon is actually 
the central atom and that four hydrogens are bound each to the central atom, not to each other, but to the central atom. So what they look like, what a molecule looks like, will often determine how it acts. And so knowing its structure is, is very important. Uh, this, this is a kind of a flat, a flat kind of a, a way, as, in it, as if it was in two dimensions where a carbon and the four hydrogens would stick out like all flat on the table. But uh, you know it's not like that. It's three-dimensional. You've got electrons that are all negative, and they're trying to stay away from each other, and so you end up very three-dimensional. You have the one that works a little bit better. It's, it's on paper, but yet it shows you something, and this is called a perspective drawing. If I were going to draw a methane molecule, two of them would have straight lines. So first of all, I'd have to know that there's a central carbon atom, and that line is indicating that that is the plane that the board is in, the paper is in, the screen is in, whatever. And you are going to have two of these that are in that plane. Well, you're going to have one that's coming out, and it's indicated by a darkened arrow. So you're going to have kind of a wedge-shaped arrow here. And that's showing you that it's coming out of the board at you or out of the paper at you. And then you're going to have... A, another arrow that's kind of like, like dotted lines in the back. So you've got one going in the back, one coming out the front, and then two on the ends. And that's the easiest way to kind of show three dimensions in a drawing. It's a perspective. Um, the other ones are using models. Now this is a computer drawing of a model. But if you have a plastic model, I've got a box full of plastic models, and they're balls and sticks, and it's showing you angles and things like that. But one would represent the carbon, that central atom, and then the four hydrogens that would come off of it. Uh, you also have a space-filling model where instead of kind of a line, that's a stick that's connecting them, um, they are kind of overlapping as though that the, the spheres were overlapping space. Because that's what's actually happening since they're sharing electrons they're sharing regions of space together. So these aren't little hard balls. These are essentially uh, orbits of electrons in space. And so uh, space filling models kind of more depictive of what's actually happening. So here's some space filling models of various things that I, I just kind of made the small one a little bit bigger. So carbon monoxide, that's one. Oxi uh, one oxygen, the red here is oxygen, carbon dioxide, two. So you're going to see that there's some special ways to name them. Also, they can configure in different ways. You can have hydrogen, uh, in this case, hydrogen and oxygen can configure as water, or hydrogen and oxygen can configure as peroxide. Uh, carbon and oxygen can configure as carbon monoxide, which is the poisonous gas that comes out of a tailpipe. And carbon dioxide is also carbon and oxygen. That's what comes out of your lungs when you breathe. These different forms of an element which have different chemical formulas are known as allotropes. Um, so allotropes differ in their chemical and physical properties. So um, yeah, I could drink water, but I wouldn't want to drink hydrogen peroxide. Um, I, could, I could breathe in some carbon dioxide. It would make me sleepy. But if you breathe in carbon monoxide, it would kill you. So they have different properties too.